Hi, this is Paul Hitchcock with the estate and asset protection planning firm Bart Colorone. Thanks for checking into the Culture of Asset Protection TV channel here on YouTube. If you haven't subscribed yet, click below. There's a link because we put out some really great videos on planning issues and my colleague Brad Barth is doing this video and he is a top speaker on estate and asset protection planning to a ton of groups across the country. This is a really important topic. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks for checking in and I'll see you next time. Often there's a big misconception as to what an estate plan does for an individual. Most people think of an estate plan purely as who gets your stuff when you pass away. I like to say that most people think of estate planning as purely as death documents, when in fact that's not the case. I think that for a lot of us, one of the more important elements of an estate plan is who makes decisions for us if we're otherwise unable to make those decisions for ourselves. So those, those decisions kind of fall into two main categories. The first one being the advanced healthcare directive and who makes medical decisions for us. And then the, the durable power of attorney for the management of property and personal affairs. Who makes financial decisions for us if we're unable to make those decisions for ourselves as well. And nothing to do with transfer of assets. We, we are the beneficiary of, the, of those documents and somebody else is making decisions for our benefit. So here again, it's very important that an estate plan is not just a will, not just who gets your stuff when you pass away, but who makes decisions for you if you're alive and unable to make them for yourself. So kind of taking them from, uh, I would say, easier to more complicated. In California, we have what's called an advanced healthcare directive. Who makes medical decisions for you if you can't make them for yourself? So here you would designate an individual or a couple of individuals in order of succession. If you're married, it's almost always going to be the surviving spouse. And if not the spouse, because maybe the spouse predeceases or maybe the spouse themselves is otherwise incapacitated, then you'd have an agent, maybe an adult child, brother, sister, friends, parents. That would be number one agent. If not, maybe a number two agent in succession. So if, you're, if someone needs to make medical decisions for you, we can make them. Otherwise, we have to go to court and get what's called a conservatorship. Now, I'll talk about conservatorships in a different video blog, but for purposes of today, we'll go ahead and disregard what a conservatorship is. So here we want to designate agents, and the agents will make medical decisions for us. But also, not only does the agent have the authority to make medical decisions for us, our agent also has the power to exercise our previously written instructions not to receive medical care under certain circumstances. Here in California, we had what was formerly called the Natural Death Act, which basically says, I would say it's more of an acknowledgement that modern, modern medical technology has made possible the artificial prolongation of our life beyond natural means. And but for that human intervention, our body would have naturally expired within a matter of weeks, days, months, hours, or anything lesser included. And under those circumstances, such as a medically determined irreversible coma, a coma where you're not coming out of it, or a situation where you have no brain activity, you're in a persistent vegetative state, and nothing is being done but for the artificial uh, extension of your life beyond natural, uh, natural means, basically to remove that medical intervention, let your body do naturally what it's going to do, but at the same time, you still want to receive palliative care to basically uh, for your comfort and otherwise to alleviate pain. And so many of us may recall that case about 20 some odd years ago when the state of Florida, the Terry Schiavo case, kind of put this issue on the map where you had Terry Schiavo herself who was uh, otherwise, uh, uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, brain dead. And her husband was saying, pull the plug. Um, I and Terry, from our previous conversations, I knew she wouldn't want to be kind of left in this kind of this, this, this state where her parents were saying, no, no, I want to keep her alive. You never know what may happen to her in the future. And since we didn't have any affirmative statement as to what Terry herself wanted, the state of Florida couldn't get involved and ultimately became a media circus and ultimately was resolved with the Florida Supreme Court. So here, these documents in the California Advanced Healthcare Directive and in other forms around the country, we are referred to as a living will. Now, don't confuse that, and it often is confused with what's called a last will. A last will and testament is basically a way in which after you pass away to transition assets, 
uh, to, for the benefit of beneficiaries. This is called a living, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, yeah, a living will. A living here in California, again, it's part of our advanced healthcare directive. It's where we have the affirmative statement which says, under cer certain circumstances, I do not want to receive medical care. Let my body do naturally what it's going to do. So these are all very important elements. Also, it's very important as part of advanced medical care is how you feel about burials versus cremations, final instructions, how do you feel about anatomical gifting, what quality of life do you want to have regarding long-term care needs. California really has a great document that, ha that addresses those long-term care quality of life issues and wanting to maintain independence and privacy as long as possible. And if you do require to be put into a care facility, you want one that's kind of close to, close to friends and family. It's a home-like setting. It's least restrictive. It offers outdoor activities and social interactions. These are all statements that need to be in, in the document. The document is designed to give our agents direction. So we want to make sure under those circumstances we tell them what we want to have happen with us because the documents normally are used under those circumstances where we can't speak for ourselves and let our wishes known. So we need to go ahead and exercise our, 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 our legal rights to sign these documents while we have the capacity and comprehension and appreciation to do so. So that's the medical side, but it also falls into the other category of property management. And these are all the things that you and I do every single day. Pay our mortgage, access to mail, safety deposit boxes, banks, exercising stock, filing claims and litigation, filing our taxes, collecting government benefits, you name it, we deal with financial situations all the time. So here again, if you're unable to manage your own financial affairs, we have to designate an agent to do that for us. So here again, now we're talking about a power of attorney for financial management. So here again, they may be the same people that you, you chose in the previous document for medical care, but it doesn't have to be. It can be completely different people. You may have trust in one person to make medical care, but that person may not be the person that you want them to have access to your bank account. Uh, you may want to have your kids on medical, but you want your brother on for, for financial. It's perfectly okay. But here again, who makes decisions for you from a financial point of view if you're unable to make them for yourself? And not only is it important for all of us every single day to have these types of documents, but for those of us who also who are business owners. And if you don't have a buy-sell agreement, and again, I'll talk about a buy-sell in another video blog, but if you don't have a buy-sell agreement and you have a business partner, pay attention to who that primary agent is in their power of attorney for financial management. Because one of the powers included in that power of attorney is going to be the power to vote the stock. And if you're in a business part partner, let's say, for example, it's 50-50, and you guys get along just great, but you and their spouse don't get along so good, and all of a sudden, their spouse now has the power to exercise that stock, that could cause some, that could cause some friction and some stalemates within the company that otherwise is unintended. Again, a buy-sell agreement is a way to kind of prevent that from happening, but for those of us who have business partners and we don't have a buy-sell agreement, the power of attorney is an important thing because that's going to be the person who exercises the stock or exercises the LLC membership interest if our business partner is otherwise unable. So here again, these are just elements of an overall comprehensive plan. It's not just who gets your stuff when you pass away. Don't forget about the very important elements of who makes decisions for you, both in a medical situation as well as financial, if you yourself can't make those for yourself. So here again, if you have any questions, please reach out to me. My name is Brad Barth. I'm partner of the firm of Barth Calderon, where we plan today for all your tomorrows. Thanks for your attention. Bye-bye.